Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at, in the, this webinar. Uh, where we're looking at how we have three examples or three innovation labs driving impact and responding to achieving the global food security strategy. Um, uh, today we have uh, three innovation labs, as Julie mentioned, the Nutrition Innovation, uh, Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition, Soybean Innovation Lab, and uh, the Post Harvest Loss Reduction Innovation Lab participating in this webinar, and we will begin this, uh, this series of webinars where we will be looking, uh, we, we looked first in a me in person meeting in D.C. Uh, at how this uh, innovation lab are driving in back, and today we are targeting the audience from outside D.C. and in the field and the mission, and uh, the goal of this is to see how they are, these innovation labs uh, and research program together uh, they present how the U.S. University and responding and driving the goals of the U.S. Uh, global uh, food security strategy and enhancing in-country capacity to improve food security, nutrition, and women empowerment. Uh, we will have three speakers from the, from the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, we have Dr. Patrick Webb. And uh, we, uh, we have a slide that you can see his, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, his bio from uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. Dr. Webb, he's a professor at Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. He's the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for nutri Nutrition. He's also principal investigator for the uh, Office of Food for Beef and Food Aid Quality Review. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Peter Goldsmith who is the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Soybean uh, Value Chain at the University of Illinois. Uh, also, Dr. Goldsmith is currently the director for Food and Agribusiness Management uh, Program at the University of Illinois and the fellow of the International Food and Agribusiness Management Association. We also we have with us uh, Ms. Dina Panel. <coughs> from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Post Harvest Loss Reduction. She's the program coordinator for Post Harvest Loss at the Kansas State University. Uh, previously, she worked as agriculture advisor at USDA, uh, FAS for an Ag Services in Kabul, and uh, she had a Master in International Agriculture Development from University of Davis. And uh, as Julie mentioned, if you have any question or comment, please post it on the chat box. And now I will leave it to the first speaker, Dr. Patrick Webb. Thank you, Ahmed. <clears throat> and uh, hello, everyone. Let me know if I'm not um, talking loudly enough. I note that there's at least one person joining from Africa, not North America. So uh, kudos there. And uh, we hope others will join from around the world. Um, I'm the uh, director for the Innovation Lab for Nutrition. And in, a, in the very short 15 minutes I have, I want to communicate that nutrition is fundamental to everything that USAID is doing, but not just in terms of the outcomes <clears throat> of interest, like child stunting or maternal anemia, that are uh, within the monitoring and evaluation uh, framework. Nutrition, as many of you know, cuts across uh, many other domains, especially thing, uh, domains like gender, like WASH, like education. Uh, in achieving improved nutrition through not just healthy diets, but also improved uh, caring practices and behaviors relating to uh, choice of water sources and so on. These all matter uh, to nutrition. But what I'm really going to focus on here is how nutrition also uh, runs along the entire value chain. So while our work in the nutrition lab is not focused on uh, individual commodities because they happen to be nutritious, let's, uh, let's say uh, animal source foods or uh, millets or pulses, right? Um, what we are focused on is how investments in improving on-farm practices and storage, uh, post-harvest and transformation of foods uh, how all of those also can relate to nutrition and how attention to certain concerns in nutrition. And the, one, uh, the main one I'm going to focus on is food safety in the context of mycotoxins, uh, natural um, molds in foods. How 
those kind of concerns about the quality and safety of foods that people eat very closely links up the, the research and programmatic concerns of nutrition, but also post-harvest losses, uh, the various ag research agendas, um, and farm improvement, and so on. So let me quickly go across uh, broadly and then narrow uh, down. Um, huge strides being made uh, in reducing all, f all forms of stunting, let's say, and to some extent uh, wasting. But the circle here uh, points that while we are making some progress in reducing child stunting, OK, it's not fast enough, um, there are, there's a huge growth in malnutrition malnutrition in all its forms, if you factor in the growing uh, overweight and obesity and the persistence of large-scale uh, micronutrient deficiencies, particularly uh, iron uh, deficiency anemia, uh, vitamin A deficiency, zinc, and so on. So when we talk nutrition, we've got to understand that there are many forms of nutrition that while quality of diet is actually a, an underpinning of all of these forms, it's not the only contributor or only solution, but it's one uh, thereof, that we have to tailor our programming and our thinking and our research to be able to re address these very large numbers of, of affected. Now, the, uh, the global food security strategy is very clear that there are links across from uh, food-based or agriculture-led economic growth, which makes certain kinds of food more available or more affordable or more accessible. Uh, so there's a whole bolus, the green circle there, of, of research and programming activities uh, seeking to achieve that. It has to be linked to an environment in which policies and programs strengthen the resi resilience of food systems, of communities, of individuals, uh, to, to, to better manage risks of many kinds, both shocks uh, and climate change and so on. That's the blue circle. And then the orange circle um, sees a well-nourished population, not just as an outcome, but an input to uh, the first two. So it, uh, in, we need to find ways to achieve minimal, minimally nutritious diets that are, that are affordable. We need to make sure they're safe. We need to make sure that um, people are knowledgeable and able to act in ways that improve nutrition um, overall. So those three circles map out to the three main themes of the Nutrition Innovation Lab, which cut across that uh, large research and, and strategic agenda of USAID and its partners. And one is, how do we better understand the kinds of investments and the kinds of programming that are supportive of agriculture to have positive impacts on nutrition and reduce negative impacts on nutrition? Uh, so nutrition sensitive programming, in a sense, and multi-sector inter interventions, large scale or scaled up uh, activities that try to improve both diets and nutrition um, through an agriculture lens. So we're doing research on that. We also do research on the policy environment, the, the kinds of policies uh, that countries need, but especially the capacities, capabilities, incentives, disincentives for civil servants and other uh, agents of change to implement those policies in ways that can promote agriculture, but also reduce um, uh, vulnerability to, to shocks and, uh, and improve resilience. And then thirdly, I, I use the term biological mechanisms, but really to, to point out that nutrition isn't just about food or nutrients, it's about what the, our human bodies do with those. And we need actually to know a lot more uh, than we do, uh, given that we're now concerned with all forms of malnutrition, not just one or other in silos. The Nutrition Innovation Lab has four focus countries, uh, particularly Nepal and Uganda, but we also have a large uh, research, uh, operations research programming in Bangladesh uh, and work in Malawi. Um, we have additional activities in green, uh, which are other countries around the world where targets of opportunity largely driven by the missions themselves have led to either uh, individual studies or ongoing engagement. 
um, both in Southeast Asia and, and Africa, and actively exploring additional new uh, study sites um, in places like Cambodia, uh, Afghanistan, and, and um, Mozambique. So we're African Asia, obviously, um, but with a very distinct focus in a few countries. I've read Circle Around Nepal because that's the one I'm going to focus on in this case, uh, simply because a, um, a lack of time. Now in Nepal, it's not just one study, it's not just one uh, issue that is being addressed. That's the same with the other countries. Uh, I'm just showing here that uh, we have research in 26, at least 26 locations across Nepal, which in effect re represent a research platform that allows us to um, explore in quite some depth complex issues that require us to be in, in situ um, interacting with, in this case in Nepal, close to 4,000 households from one year to the next. So we're doing longitudinal panel surveys uh, that address agricultural investments and those impacts uh, on uh, diets, livelihoods, and nutrition. We're looking, uh, there are different colors you can see uh, in the legend and on the map, that uh, different kinds of programs, some supported by USAID, others by other donors, that will have impacts on what is happening at the household level in terms of investment choices and the uh, the ability to impact on nutrition. Um, a lot of that is longitudinal, a lot of that is uh, trying to track uh, improvements in uh, birth outcomes, in stunting, in wasting, in maternal BMI, uh, and so on, in relation to the kinds of ag uh, programming, the kinds of choices made with with um, agricultural outputs. Do they do households choose to eat these commodities or sell them? Or uh, is it better to specialize or to diversify? Many of the key questions in nutrition-sensitive agriculture are directly um, being uh, addressed through this research. But I want to focus that little circle, uh, again, red circle in the uh, southwest, one specific study uh, in Banke district, which is looking at mycotoxins, right? It's looking at aflatoxins, which we know are natural, naturally occurring molds that occur on maize and uh, uh, peanuts and uh, peppers and many other foods, including rice. These are naturally t natural toxins that are highly carcinogenic, uh, but there is a lot of attention these days to the potential for mycotoxins to be affecting birth outcomes and then linear growth of children. So what we're looking for in this study, we're following uh, 1,600 women through their pregnancies to look at the effect of aflatoxin in their blood. So through their diet, what are the rates of aflatoxin in their blood? Does that correlate with birth outcomes? And does that those birth outcomes then correlate with the growth of children so we can actually finally better understand if aflatoxins play a role or not in stunting uh, through various mechanisms. So this particular graph simply shows AFB1, that's aflatoxin, um, and the levels in that location in Nepal uh, are clearly way higher um, at certain times in the year, uh, with the December period onwards into spring, which is several months after harvest, and significantly different from the period pre-harvest and during harvest. And all that says, uh, suggests at this point, is that the households we're looking at, 1,648 um, households, the levels of aflatoxin in the blood of the women in those households is, is highly correlated by a season, which suggests they are consuming foods that have been stored for many months already. So we'll be teasing out to what extent were, were the levels of athlete, is that relating to poor farm management, to poor choices about what to store and how to store it, but then what you do if you have moldy foods in your store, what, what happens to that? What do you do? Do you eat it? Do you feed it to your cattle? Do you destroy it? Do you sell it? Um, we have a problem. Uh, because the rates of um, exposure in these women, these pregnant women, or these women at pregnancy is extremely high. About 94% of the women in this sample have detectable levels of aflatoxin in their, their blood. What I'm showing here is that actually the levels are highest 
among the younger women who are pregnant. So we're, we're seeing a lot of, of pregnancies among what we would call adolescent girls, and that is pretty significant. It's potentially affecting not only their own health and nutrition, but it may be affecting um, the, the first birth of many of these uh, young women. And we have to understand why why is that? Is it because they are, there are certain food restrictions that are forcing them to eat the aflatoxin-laden foods? Are they eating foods um, in the fields that others are not? These are things that we need to tease out, but there is clearly a problem here and we have to focus on aflatoxin among all pregnant women, but especially in the uh, younger ages. We have, these are not published data yet, these are just uh, hot off the press from a subsample. Um, we are seeing that uh, there is a, a statistically significant correlation between uh, rates of aflatoxin in the blood of the mothers at, during pregnancy and low birth weight. So there is a correlation with uh, um, birth outcomes um, at the 5% at the level. We're still exploring the data, but this is one of the first prospective um, findings that we can uh, as opposed to cross-sectional, that we can report on this. So I think it really links the agriculture and food systems uh, issues around aflatoxin with the human concerns, and we need to find ways to address this uh, as a human uh, problem in relation to nutrition. With multivariate analysis, and I'll be very, stopping very quickly, the odds of having a low birth weight infant, they include short maternal stature and being a girl, uh, but they also include having high rates of aflatoxin in the blood. Even once you account for all the covariates, uh, it's still a significant uh, parameter. Um, when counting the other things. Improved education, improved diet diversity, improved status of the mother, they all seem to be correlated with less risk of, of low birth weight. But the point here, low birth weight is correlated with independently and significantly with uh, aflatoxin in the blood. Just a final one, actually jumping to Uganda, we also have found that uh, infants uh, in Uganda from mothers who had both HIV, were both HIV positive and higher rates of aflatoxin, were significant, had significantly lower height, height for age or stunting, higher stunting than those uh, who were born of women who were HIV negative. So there's, there's something here linking the food coming from the field and stored with what people, what certain categories of women consume and their own health and behavior, and then the birth outcomes and the stunting of their children. This means we need to be very careful uh, about what we do in promoting certain kinds of crops. We need to be very careful about farm management and storage. Finally, environmental enteropathy is linked uh, to this as to other uh, kinds of problems. Don't worry too much about the slide. The point is here, but looking at the leaky gut of 400 children almost in Uganda, found a quite variety of outcomes, 21% with no leaky gut, but 22% severe. Interestingly, those households with where the children had the leakiest guts were ones that allowed sheep and goats wandering around inside their home and sometimes slept inside their home. And that was correlated with higher stunting and wasting, which again suggests something about the environment and the food system, in this case livestock system, uh, that children are growing up in. So the final points, agricultural productivity, we need, they are important, absolutely important to uh, resolve all forms of, of malnutrition. But at the same time, they are only part of the solution and we have to understand how that part of the solution carries risks or threats that are health-based. They are driven through the mycotoxins that come through the food supply, they affect wash, they are affecting pathogens that are brought in with, uh, with livestock. So even if there are more nutritious crops available or animal source foods available, we need to better understand how vulnerable populations eat those kinds of foods and how their bodies absorb or not those kinds of foods to achieve the kinds of results that we want to see 
lower stunting, lower anemia, lower um, MUAC, uh, higher MUAC and BMI for, for women. This matters immensely for all of the goals of the global food security strategy. And I will stop there. All right, thank you so much, Patrick. That was great. Uh, Peter, it's over to you now. Hello. I think it's working now. Um, uh, yes, Peter, we can hear you. Super, super. Hey, thank you so much for inviting uh, me and uh, the team from the Soybean Innovation Lab to participate in this great, great event. Um, my, uh, my talk today, uh, they asked us to speak for about 15 minutes. Um, we'll focus, I, I really want to um, think about strategy and think about the global food security strategy obviously following from the, the Feed the Future strategy about how innovation labs um, have kind of redefined themselves and uh, how they have um, made themselves uh, per the strategy uh, much more relevant uh, to really drive impact. And I'm going to use uh, SIL, the Soybean Innovation Lab, and as, as an example, and then two uh, just brief case studies of two of our uh, lead researchers uh, and their work to give you um, a sense of um, what this new model looks looks like. So, so do do have your uh, ears alert to a strategic shift and a, and a redesign, which is what I'm going to describe. Um, let's see, wait for the slide to move. Yeah, ooh, there's a lag. Good. Um, yeah, I thought there was a lag. One sec, I'll get used to the lag. So um, I've, I will provide a, a brief overview of the Soybean Innovation Lab. But really, my focus is how SIL is an expression of the Feed the Future and the Global Food Security Strategies. And we're matching what we've explicitly designed and oriented ourselves uh, to match evidence and technology, which is what the Global Food uh, Security Strategy uh, feels um, is, is, is necessary a greater use of evidence, but also blending it with development's pace. Um, the university, uh, instead of sitting further in the background doing longer term studies, is really trying to match development's pace and be relevant to the practitioner uh, on the ground. So the first walk away is that USAID via the SIL model has found that sweet spot for integrating sorely needed evidence and robust findings directly piped into, in real time, the development system. That's through partnerships directly with practitioners. And the second walk away uh, for uh, my university friends and administrators is I think we found a way for universities to have um, a structure and provide structure and strategic guidance um, on how to become directly engaged in the development system. So we move away from this periphery where we've traditionally been on training graduate students, improving university institutions, which are all very important, contributing long cycle research, also very important. But this is a new role, an additional role. Um, so that's, um, that's a quick uh, the, the walkaways for uh, today's talk. Uh, uh, this innovation lab, SIL, is in its fourth year. University of Illinois is the lead. We're uh, partnered with Mississippi State University, University of Missouri, and the International Institute for Tropical Ag in Nibadan. Uh, what we do, our mission is to establish a foundation for soybean development in the developing world, principally Africa. So we provide technical knowledge 
and ap associated appropriate technologies to make successful those trying to develop soybean in emerging markets. So we don't work with farmers. We work with researchers, extensionists, the private sector, contractors, NGOs, who, of course, uh, many of whom are, are working with farmers, uh, helping them be successful. There's a lot of interest in, in uh, developing soybean. SIL sits in the background providing the technology uh, and evidence to help those practitioners be successful. Our expertise is very narrow. We stick to our knitting. We focus on producing and utilizing soybean in the tropics. That's what we do well. Um, our scope, uh, we focus on the soybean value chain. So we focus from inputs, inoculum, and so forth, all the way through uh, livestock and human nu nutrition. Um, Uh, we started out when we uh, initiated the project uh, in five countries. We're now in uh, 13 countries uh, working in partnership with uh, the private sector, uh, with uh, contractors, USAID mission contractors, local NGOs, etc. Okay. So, just to kind of step back a bit, and uh, these are large documents, and I'm sure some have read them who are, uh, it's important to, to, in their jobs, but many of us have not. And there are two, there's explicit strategies that drive uh, what we do at the innovation labs, how we're designed, and what we're meant to um, accomplish. And, you know, originally when we started, there was a feed the future strategy and the global food security strategy. What these, when they, when these spoke to, to, to the labs, their strategies for a variety of mechanisms USAID employs, but for the labs, uh, it was about research for development. How the research and the expertise that we have at the universities uh, can be um, relevant and improve development outcomes. Uh, and the strategies explicitly are calling, as well as independent reviews from the National Science Foundation, for greater evidence um, to be deployed uh, in the development programs, rather than um, uh, uh, um, just uh, initiating uh, development projects, try to base them on uh, evidence, fact, uh, and and precedent and proven uh, mechanisms and, and 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 process. So that's what the the strategy is urging um, the development system, but also guidance for for the innovation labs. Um, and SIL as an example, and soybean as an example. These are some slides showing just the tremendous demand for soy, the tremendous growth for soybean globally. The upper left graph just shows that uh, soybean has been the fastest growing crop for the last 20 years, about a third faster than the next crop, which is uh, rape canola. Um, so there's tremendous interest. Um, the right-hand slide of the map is uh, a lot of soybean development in Latin America, and a lot of work has shown that there's great potential for soy in Africa as well. Uh, and then the blow uh, slide is some price data that we uh, work with in Ghana, just showing the strength of uh, prices uh, in, uh, in Africa, that prices are very strong. Uh, that deep red line is the price in Chicago, and the other lines are local prices in Ghana. So prices are very good. So demand is very good. And this caused back um, uh, a number of years ago a lot of interest in using soy as a development mechanism to drive economic development, to reduce poverty, and reduce malnutrition. But in the enthusiasm to develop soy, uh, there was a lack of evidence used, so that a lot of the projects struggled, yields remained low, and so USAID 
very smartly back in 2012 initiated an RFP which was an attempt to get the evidence horse back in front of the development cart and that's where SIL comes in uh, and, and that's the, the genesis of the Soybean Innovation Lab. Um, we explicitly designed SIL with 10 key tactical approaches. This is listening to what the, the GFSS uh, Research for Development Strategies were, were asking us. We designed our, our, our model appropriately. So SIL only works through partnerships with practitioners. All of our work is in in-country, meaning in Africa, we're also in uh, Pakistan and Indonesia. We work only in partnership in country. These are faculty who, who run these programs. These aren't uh, generalists. These aren't temporary um, uh, 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 contractors or, and so forth. These are faculty who have spent a lifetime working in a particular area. They directly engage the practitioners, which is a real, a real treat, a real a nice relationship, especially for the faculty engaging with practitioners and that hands-on experience and that feedback, but also the practitioners uh, to have real expertise right at their fingertips. These specialist faculty members, you're going to meet two of them a little bit later, write proposals, manage the projects, are actively engaged in country. And this is a, a very exciting role for them and, and for the labs uh, and universities historically a different role. Uh, we, we're very good listeners. Because we partner, we listen, we listen, we listen, we listen first, second, and third, and we're very much needs driven. What skills can we brought to solve the practitioner's problem? We're very grounded. We're on the ground uh, with our partners addressing the problems that they pose to us. Um, we're, we're very much uh, sustained and focused uh, and engaged with our partners. These are not short-term projects. These are long-term. We've now been three and a half years. Uh, uh, and we've really built very strong relationships as mentors, teachers, and trainers. Um, we're, we deliver very applied research. We're not about publications. We're about servicing the needs of our practitioner clients who are trying to develop soybean, whether they be a researcher at a NARS, an extensionist, uh, or a private sector firm. Um, and we uh, value the disciplines. We have plant breeders, we have nutritionists, we have economists, we have anthropologists, and working uh, in with disciplinary strength in a multidisciplinary setting. So we cluster activities and we think this is very important that you don't just pop in and pop out in lots of locations. We're very clustered so that the um, uh, we get good feedback uh, and and learning and the different disciplines learn from each other. So we think these are good 10, 10 good rules for how an innovation lab can have impact uh, directly with uh, their practitioner partners. Uh, we have a uh, organizational structure. These are you're not meant to read these, but these different colors are a sample of the kind of partners that each of our discipline area uh, programs has. They only work through partnerships, lots of partnerships. Um, these are faculty-led units, as I men mentioned. Our innovation lab is not a granting organization. Uh, in the past, some of the labs and the CRIPS are granting organizations, still is not. This is a managed program executing strategy through 10 business units. So we have a common culture and present a common culture to our uh, client practitioners. And the lesson is that universities can be responsive to development needs and bring to bear the expertise of leading faculty. So it's 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 pretty cool. Um, let me give you two examples before I close out. Um, uh, Dr. Ragsdale is at Mississippi State University. 
Um, she heads up our uh, managed research area seven, which is women's empowerment and gender. She's a professor. She's an anthropologist. Just a, just a tremendous uh, uh, faculty member down at MSU. She partners with Catholic Relief Services. And, and she's really answering a fundamental, fundamental question that practitioners struggle with. Because gender is such an important issue in agriculture, when you introduce a crop like soybean, which is very different from a native staple, it is going to have significant disruptive effects on the social fabric of whether it be the household, the household economy, communities, because uh, markets are so important. Uh, technology is transferred from private sector and as well as extensionists, which are male dominated. Uh, mechanization becomes important because scale uh, is, is necessary uh, for, for smallholders to, to, to compete. Um, and, and women's uh, uh, um, integration with mechanization is, is, is not well understood. So this introducing a commercial crop, soybean, uh, is normatively very different than working with uh, native staples. And that's what uh, Dr. Ragsdale, her body of work and her collaboration and her partnership is meant to guide practitioners and help them uh, achieve gender balance and be gender sensitive uh, because soy is not um, uh, a, a traditional crop uh, and, and, and well understood, especially from a um, social or anthropological uh, sense. So that's Dr. Dr. Ragsdale. And, and finally, I give you an example of um, uh, Dr. Juan Andrade, who's a, a nutritionist. He leads our managed research area five on human nutrition. Uh, he partners with the Catholic Relief Services, with University for Development Studies, a university in northern Ghana. Um, and he's working with a pre-commercial pro product uh, that called Comfa, which is uh, from orange flesh. It's a uh, weaning food developed from orange flesh sweet potato. Uh, the question was uh, to the, from the practitioner about adapting this weaning food to improve the nutrition because it was low in protein. And complementing it with soy uh, elevates the protein. And the question was, would that not only make it nutritionally better, but how would it function for women uh, processing uh, and, and producing the, the weaning food? And would it be acceptable uh, to children? And so that's where Dr. Andrade uh, fits right in with the uh, practitioner uh, looking to develop an enhanced uh, COMFA product, weaning food product. Um, so this is a, another example of a faculty member, an expert working directly with and injecting himself directly into the development process to provide evidence and, 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 and good science. So that's all I had to, uh, for today. Thanks so much again for the opportunity to visit with you. Look forward to your questions. Uh, and I'll turn it back to the organizers. everybody. This is, uh, my name is Dina Bunnell. I'm with the Post-Harvest Loss Innovation Lab. Um, and so thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, a special shout out, I think, to our West Coast colleagues because it's very early there. So kudos to you for, for calling in this morning. Um, hey, and hey, I'm Dina, just going to talk a bit about um, Post-Harvest Losses. Is a little and bit low. Um, are you, uh, I, I, I seem to recall, I think you're using a headset. Um, can you make sure that it's positioned near your mouth and or just speak up a little bit? Um, if so, thank you. And uh, if she's still, if her volume is still a little bit low, folks, um, she is not in the same location that I am. Uh, you might just have to turn off the volume on your computer. Okay, thank you. Sure, sorry. I will uh, try to speak up. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a few minutes about um, post-harvest loss and the, its impact uh, in the work that we're doing and, and how that fits into the global food security strategy. Uh, and beyond. So post-harvest losses um, have a, a, a tremendous impact both um, in quantity but also in quality loss uh, for the products. And, and those losses occur 
uh, in food safety, nutrition, and, and economic implications. Um, if you, the photo on the slide here, I, I, it's one of my favorite photos because I think it is a great example of those implications um, really shown in, in one snapshot there. The photo on the left is a, a handful of chickpeas. This is out of our project in Ethiopia that have been hermetically stored. And on the right uh, is a traditional stored chickpea with, uh, that's been infested with insects. And you can see, if you can see uh, the little white dots on those chickpeas, those are actually insect eggs. And so it's pretty easy to anticipate in this situation that um, the, the product on the right has, could have some very serious potential food safety implications, which, which we'll talk about a bit more later. But as well, they're shriveled. You can tell that the nutritional capacity uh, of those chickpeas is, is really reduced um, by this. Uh, you know, they've been eaten through by these insects. And if you took that, these chickpeas to market, obviously there would be some economic implications to that. So it just really epitomizes the importance of proper post-harvest um, storage in these types of crops. And losses are estimated um, of a, up to one-third in developing economies. Um, and that's for stored crops. Horticultural crops, of course, can be even higher than that. But the evidence base so far, um, it's fairly scant, and, and methodologies um, haven't been as robust as they could be. Um, and so that's one of our areas of focus in our lab. And many in, uh, interventions are available. Um, and, and a lot of the work that we've been done has been to test ones that exist or develop new ones that are appropriate for the, um, for the situations in which we're working. So the Post Harvest Loss Innovation Lab uh, is based at Kansas State University, although we are a, uh, we're a robust consortium of US-based and, and universities and organizations in the countries in which we work. Uh, and we, as I mentioned, we focus on stored crops, grains, legumes, seeds, uh, et cetera. Um, and we have our, our key technical areas are in drying, storage, uh, and mycotoxin assessments. Um, and a big component of that is moisture measurement as well. Um, and in addition, we have cross-cutting um, topics in capacity building, really focusing on the human institutional capacity building in the countries in which we're working. Uh, to date, we have worked with 19 graduate students in uh, the local universities in the countries where we work, as well uh, as here in the United States, here at K-State, as well as Oklahoma State, University of Nebraska. Uh, and we also focus on nutrition and gender, which we'll get into a bit later, and, and also a big emphasis on engagement um, and really leveraging the extension capacity of the land-grant university system to focus on effective education and adoption in the work that we're doing. And so to date, we have trained uh, upwards of 5,000 participants through training and workshops in our focused countries um, and tested a variety of, of, of different post-harvest technologies. Um, and in addition, we have a robust uh, public-private partnership strategy where we're working with international companies like John Deere and Romer Labs uh, and, and most recently um, Mars, um, particularly their Global Food Safety Lab, as well as, as local companies um, uh, in the, where we're working. And so our focus countries are, if I can, there we go. Uh, so our four core countries um, that span the length of our five-year project are Guatemala, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. In addition to that, we, uh, we had a buy-in project that has since ended in Afghanistan where we did a mycotoxin assessment on wheat, raisins, and tree nuts. And we've just recently started new projects in Nepal and Honduras where we're doing mycotoxin assessments there as well. So in our program, in year one, we really focused on establishing these baseline surveys um, assessing what the post-harvest losses were and what those impacts really were and developing partnerships in country. Uh, and then in years two and three, we focused on doing the research and adaptation of the post-harvest technologies that we're working with. Now we're moving into years four and five, and, and we're really focused on um, piloting those adaptive technologies and scaling up and, and encouraging adoption of these technologies um, and really focusing on um, the ability to get these technologies in the hands of users. Some of the different technologies that we've tested, um, as I mentioned before, uh, have been on drying, storage, and, and moisture. Um, this has included the Sol Solar Biomax Hybrid Dryer, which was actually a technology designed um, chiefly by uh, an engineer in Ghana uh, at the KNUST University in Ghana. Um, 
And, and so that's a new technology that we've developed, whereas the STR dryer uh, is, is um, a technology we have in Bangladesh that we've actually modified that from a dryer that was being used in in Vietnam, and they've actually, uh, and they actually, our team at the Bangladesh Agricultural University played a huge role in modifying that dryer to conditions appropriate for our communities in Bangladesh. And so we've really had a focus on having integrated technology packages so that we're addressing not just one piece of the post-harvest um, game, but, but sort of more broadly. And, and so you see our Bangladesh program um, has STR dryer that I just described, and, and partnering with that, a focus on hermetic seed storage, part, using grain pro bags and picks bags, which many of you are familiar with. And so that's a really good example of us taking those off-the-shelf technologies uh, and, and testing them and making them fit in the environments in which we're working. In Ghana, we have the, so the photos that you see are that solar biomass hybrid dryer that I mentioned. Um, it's like greenhouse type um, setup, and it actually uses solar to dry and disinfest the grain. And when solar is not available, it has a biomass furnace as well. And so, as I mentioned, that was designed in country. And we're coupling that with the EMC moisture meter, which we're, which we're using across our project countries. Um, and that was actually designed by one of our partners at USDA ARS. Um, and so, in our Ghana a program is a really good example of some of these new technologies that we've developed, really focusing at the aggregator level in this program um, and really trying to make an impact across the value chain. And so as we move forward, we'll continue to take these integrated approaches, um, focusing on enhancing that national capacity. Um, and then uh, as we continue to have a greater focus in addressing these mycotoxins, really trying to identify um, what the risks are and how we can map those in the future. And we'll talk about that a bit more. We, um, we'll talk about our Nepal project. But really trying to integrate um, throughout the process from all, all the actors in that value chain how we can have a comprehensive approach to uh, reducing post-harvest losses and improving food security. So specifically related to nutrition, um, we have tried to have a, a, a big impact in, in both the food safety and the nutritional impact of proper post-harvest loss um, and as an integrated approach. Um, and that includes doing some work through uh, value addition, um, which we have, uh, we have some outstanding researchers here at Kansas State University that have done some, some pioneering work in extrusion um, as one uh, opportunity to do that, particularly with their Ethiopia program. Um, and then, of course, we'll have, we have a strong emphasis in the food safety um, aspect of this as well. And so you heard a bit about this already from Patrick, but aflatoxin uh, is, is a major threat to food and nutritional security and one that, of which the impacts of are becoming better known. Um, but a lot of research still needs to be done. Um, and so mycotoxins, which aflatoxin is the most well known, of course, are fungal metabolites. Um, it's estimated that they can impact up to 25% of the global food supply. So the, so the problem is vast. Um, it is chronic exposure um, has been causal links to cancer and correlated links to stunting and immunosuppression. Um, and acute exposure can even lead to death. Um, and it has a huge impact on agriculture, health, trade, and environment. Um, and worst of all, when it comes to aflatoxins, is that they're often undetectable uh, or invisible to the naked eye, which makes the both of the detection and the education piece surrounding mycotoxin particularly uh, challenging. Um, and in addition to that, some of our work that we've done in Guatemala, for example, um, so as we measure aflatoxin, you know, we look at parts per billion and, and things like this, but something that we've discovered we also need to think about is not just the levels in a particular sample, but what are the actual um, consumption patterns? Of, of the populations in which we're working. So in Guatemala, um, aflatoxin levels in, a, in our initial analysis have suggested that, that levels are below, um, in the Western Highlands where we work, are below that um, the threshold. However, because maize is such a key component of the diet, um, there are significant concerns that the actual ingestion of aflatoxins may be higher than those original tests indicate. Uh, and so one of the areas in which we're really trying to lead the way in 
this mycotoxin detection and mapping is through our new project that we're starting um, in Nepal and through which we're collaborating with a variety of partners, including the Nutrition Innovation Lab um, and then also the, the Mars Global Food Safety Lab, which is located in China. Um, and really working with them on enhancing the capacity of our national partners to better detect and, and analyze mycotoxins in the food supply. And so this project it will be assessing um, aflatoxins in, in nuts, spices, um, dried chilies, as well as, as, well as wheat and maize um, and peanuts. And so it, it really is kind of covering a vast portion of the food supply. Um, as well as livestock feed in Nepal, and seeking to characterize, identify the issues, characterize um, the fungal toxins that are present, and then most importantly, really seeking to, uh, to come up with short, medium, and long-term intervention strategies. And so um, once we have identified the problem, really taking that next step in this process of what do we do now, how do we protect the most vulnerable, and in what ways can we not just reduce the level of aflatoxin, but looking at things like what are alternative uses that we can have for these products where we may never get aflatoxins completely out of the food supply, but if we can find a way to repurpose those um, in a way that, that reduces the danger for human consumption what are some of those avenues in which we can do that? And so um, that's really a, an approach that we're taking with our project in Nepal um, and, and using that analysis and risk mapping and all of the tools available to us to understand that, and as well as the vast expertise of the Nutrition Innovation Lab um, and their really robust presence in Nepal um, that Patrick talked about earlier. Moving on briefly to, to some of the ways that we've been trying to um, address gender roles uh, in our post-harvest work. Um, this is an area uh, in which even the existing literature uh, in, in gender's role in agriculture really has not had a, a presence in the post-harvest realm. And so what we tried to do uh, in, in, in our project was better understand the role of women in agriculture, but specifically the role of women in post-harvest activities. And so in, in three of our project countries, um, we conducted surveys and, and focus group discussions uh, with our communities in which we were working. Um, and we used the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index as a foundation, but we modified that survey to include questions about their roles in post-harvest. Uh, and, and how that impacts their lives. And we did it in this focus group situation rather than just household surveys um, to kind of get a community perspective of this. And so those focus group discussions um, in Ghana, we held interviews, a, a, a combination of surveys and focus group discussions with two, 418 farmers, 240 in Ethiopia, and 209 in Bangladesh. And, and those focus groups were a variety of all women's groups, all men's groups, and mixed groups. Um, and we came up, those, and the, that research is ongoing, but some of the initial findings were, were particularly interesting. Some were, some were a bit obvious. Um, but for example, it really confirmed um, what we suspected about women's role in post-harvest, uh, and that found that 88% of post-harvest work in Ethiopia is done by women. Um, in Bangladesh, during harvest season, women spend 90% of their time on post-harvest activities. Um, and, and there's really the, the time poverty distinction between men and women was really found to be incredibly stark in Ethiopia. For example, um, women were found to spend 15 to 18 hours a day working, whereas it was 7 to 9 for, women, um, for men. Excuse me. In addition to that, um, another really interesting finding, uh, and this happened across the focus groups regardless of whether they were mixed gender or not, is that women don't view themselves as the primary farmer. Men are viewed as the farmer and women are seen as auxiliaries. And so I think that's just an important point that we need to think about um, how perceptions are, are impacting that work as well, not just how men view women or vice versa, um, but also um, how women view themselves. Uh, another interesting finding um, was that in Ethiopia, for example, they have this joint land certification program that was really seeking to give women better access to land. However, what our initial survey found was that that 
policy did not actually lead to women having control over the land. And so it's an important reminder that policy does not necessarily equal behavior change. And as we continue to work in these areas, we need to think about um, the impact of that, um, both creating the policy environment that allows change to take place, but there also has to be behavior change at a community level that happens at the same time. Um, and, and finally, on, on those gender surveys, the other really important finding that, that is easy to forget when we talk about gender is that disempowerment is not something that is only affecting women in these communities. Um, oftentimes, both men and women are disempowered. The disempowerment is, is often greater um, is often greater for women, but for example, in Ghana, our survey showed that um, men were actually less empowered than women in resource decisions and access to credit, um, largely because of the, the introduction of women's savings groups and those types of organizations. Um, but women remained more disempowered in production and income decisions, for example. And so some of the ways we've tried to actualize some of these findings include focus on, um, on women's and enterprises. So for example, in our hermetic seed storage training in Bangladesh, um, what has happened is that 95% of the women who were trained in, in hermetically um, storing seed have saved that seed um, rather than purchasing from the market at much lower germination levels. Um, and then in addition to that, another 20% of those who saved their own seed then sold that excess seed. Um, and so there's some, some really economic implications that could occur there. Um, the question remaining, who has, has access to those economic gains? Like whether because the women are the ones selling the seed, do they still have access um, to that actual money? And that's, that's something that I, I think is hard to know. Um, and we've also focused on really demand-driven research, focusing on, um, uh, on adapting the technologies that we already have to make them work better for the people that need them most. So for example, in Bangladesh, parboiling rice is a major time burden um, for women. And so our research team at Bangladesh Agricultural University is now doing research on our STR dryer to see whether they can make it usable for parboiled rice as well instead of just um, patty rice. And so I, I need to wrap up, but just to, to briefly touch again on the global food security strategy, um, we really, post-harvest loss really kind of finds itself um, across all of these objectives, sustainable and inclusive growth, strength and resilience, and, and a well-nourished population for all the reasons that we've already discussed. Um, I think in particular, we have a really strong opportunity to increase resilience uh, among our populations in terms of Having better, having a better quality and and higher quantity of, of foods, both for consumption and storage in the market. And finally, I'll just end with: um, while our key objective is improving people's livelihoods, um, we also uh, have the opportunity of a dual benefit from the work that we do, and, and particularly in the current um, political environment we're in, um, I think it's it's worth highlighting that we really do have an an immense return on investment. Um, here in the U.S. for the work that we're doing. And that includes at a, at a research level in terms of we basically, um, our work in this field really gives us a global laboratory to identify pests and disease, um, improve crop breeding, a variety of other things in addition um, to, the, to the stability and trade opportunities that exist when people have better livelihoods and, and better access to, um, to more uh, economic opportunities. And so I think that that's important to keep in mind um, as we do this work that this impact, we have a, a, an ability to, to improve livelihoods across the spectrum. And that's all I've got. So I will turn it back over. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick, Peter, and Dina. Uh, it was really great to um, see your presentations. And for those of you who have joined, if you'd like to review any portion of the presentations, you can see that uh, it is available for download at the bottom left of your screen. All right, we've had some great engagement in the chat box. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who posted a question or a comment or shared a story from your work. Uh, we really appreciate seeing the, the quickly moving text there in the, in the chat box. Um, so we've had a lot of questions come through. We've been collecting them along the way, and we have about 25 minutes or so to get through as many of them as we can now. Uh, so I'm going to run through a few questions. I'll generally direct them towards uh, the person um, for whom that question came during your presentation, but of course um, 
all three presenters are welcome to chime in on any question. Uh, feel free to just um, to break in and, and you know, start speaking if you are interested in adding something to that question. This can be a little bit of an informal back and forth. And let's see. Um, going through um, the questions that came in, um, one interesting one um, came in during Peter's presentation. So Peter, perhaps you can start with this um, question. One second, I'm just pulling it up. Uh, but actually, it was echoed again uh, towards the end of the free presentation. So Matthew Krauss uh, said, to drive scale and thus impact, it seems to me that we should be talking more about connecting all of these innovations in question to the private sector that can commercialize. And then Virginia Sopila um, said to Dina, can you speak more specifically as to how the private sector is engaged in this research? Uh, particularly as it pertains to work with commercial potential, such as storage solutions. So I was hoping that all three labs could touch a bit on uh, the, your engagement with the private sector, what that has looked like in the past, what it might look like going forward. And uh, Peter, do you want sure. to pick that up? Sure, sure. Really, really good question. And I think, you know, a, not in my uh, top ten there is um, kind of a theme that says that really our work is a bridge uh, to the private sector really taking taking off and taking over from from the development efforts uh, so helping uh, that and supporting the private sector is central to what the soybean innovation lab uh, tries to do I'll give you a couple of of examples um, um, one we're, we're currently engaged in um, uh, northern Ghana and in um, uh, Ethiopia is a question about um, uh, soil pH. Uh, soybean is very sensitive to low pH um, and little work has been done among the development community uh, in terms of uh, first uh, soil testing which is so critical for tropical soybean uh, and then soil correction uh, and the challenge is um, uh, um, uh, correcting these soils using uh, lime. A uh, lime is very bulky, not very expensive, but very bulky, uh, and um, uh, logist a logistical challenge for smallholders. So we're partners. There's a company, a Swiss company called Omia, that has developed a, a prill, a very small micro-grained form of lime uh, called calcipril. Uh, and they really have, they have not applied it or tested it in a developing country setting. We've brought that product in, working with the private sector. Um, but you don't just want to go immediately to farmer trials or demo plots, right? You want to have good evidence. This is what Feed the Future and Global Food Strategy, based on evidence, um, is asking us to do, provide some um, formal evidence to guide companies like OMIA. So we partner with them. On our smart farms in Ghana and Ethiopia, we are now trialing this uh, calcipril product um, to as a solution for smallholders. So it's very much um, working in partnership, uh, listening to what the needs of the private sector are, and then bringing them uh, into your. You know, I don't want to call it research. It, it is research, but it's very applied and really oriented to the needs uh, of, of the, the practitioner, in this case, uh, the private sector. So that's one example that I'd use. And uh, Dina or Patrick, would you like to follow up? Dina, perhaps, second? Sure. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, and so our private sector partners, um, they are, um, they're diverse and, and it does vary a bit in the country in which we work and, and what makes sense in the context in which we're working. Um, I think one particularly good example where we have engaged um, actually the, the in-country private sector is our work in Bangladesh. Um, we um, have been, um, so our, our team at Bangladesh Agricultural University, uh, a, a big part of their work that they're doing is on hermetic storage. 
Um, however, there aren't so so their work includes grain pro and picks bags, but neither of those are available in country, and so they are currently at a price point that is above what the average farmer um, can afford, especially to have multiple one of these bags on their farm. <clears throat> Excuse me, and so. What we've been actively doing is engaging with um, um, ACI, which is the largest manufacturer in Bangladesh, and partnering with them to actually produce the hermetic bags locally. Um, and so that's something that we're that we're working toward currently, um, but with the goal that and and they have agreed to produce these bags and they've agreed to do the first run. Um, for free uh, with an agreement from Bangladesh Agricultural University that they provide the technical expertise that goes with distributing these, these bags. Um, and so they'll basically be selling them at cost to farmers um, once that production happens. And so that sh the goal of that to provide um, an opportunity for these farmers to actually, so the demand exists. Um, and so if we can reach that price point, um, we have the potential to uh, to have a real impact um, on these storage um, management practices, and, and and then in addition, we're we're advancing kind of local industry uh, instead of just focusing on only like U.S. based private partners. So that's one example um, that I think is a good one for for what we're trying to do um, in the countries that we're working in. Uh, thank you, Dina. And Patrick, do you have any comments on private sector engagement as well? Um, yeah, just uh, I agree with both uh, speakers that um, private sector matters for so so much of uh, value chain work um, and agriculture in general. I think recognition that private sector has a, an important role in protecting diets essentially is a, is a more recent um, realization and there are a number of, of universities um, that are working with the labs or independently looking at hermetically sealed bags um, you know there are commercial companies in the US uh, and others now appearing in Africa and Asia uh, where they're looking at storage technologies. Uh, right now, that's uh, yeah, they are often a little expensive. So, uh, and some of the um, evidence of, of effectiveness still needs uh, scrutiny. But that's there's no question that private sector in in uh, has a role to play in developing technologies, appropriate and affordable technologies, for post harvest. Um, storage, but also for um, getting h higher quality seeds to the field that can prevent pest and, and insect damage that allows molds, for example, mycotoxins to uh, to attack those uh, plants. Um, the appropriate kinds of fertilizers, all, all of those are private sector domains that need to be uh, expanded with a view to better understanding of why it matters in relation to toxin contamination of the food supply and I would just in it beyond the private sector I think there's um, there's a, a growing demand in the public sector in the extension domain in terms of ag extension but also health uh, service uh, primary health care service there's demand in many countries for what do ag, what should ag extension agents and primary health care givers what should they be aware of? What messages should they be imparting uh, to members of households to enable them to be more aware and gen of the threats and the potential solutions so that they can generate more demand that can be met by the private sector for the appropriate technologies? So I think it's not just private or public. Uh, it's the interaction of the two that will work at scale. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and I'd like to follow up with a question that came in during your presentation, Patrick, that you answered a little bit in the chat box, but I think um, could stand to be answered verbally as well. Um, Anna Twomlo, uh, recognizing that the Nutrition Innovation Lab has an incredible wealth of research findings that are being produced, uh, asked about how your findings can be scaled up to make an impact at the country level to stop stunting. Um, and a little bit further, if you wouldn't mind digging in a, a bit more into how the Nutrition Innovation Lab's findings 
can be used in a practical sense for nutrition programming, um, especially by people who may not be connected with or aware of what your lab is doing? That's a pretty broad question, Julie. Um, yeah, it's it's really important that you know what other, we are also like uh, other labs developing working on technologies. For example, in Bangladesh, we're looking very closely at certain um, drying and storage technologies that can uh, help extend the lifespan, let's say, of perishable nutrient-rich foods, they, whether they're horticulture, vegetable, or potentially even fish uh, aquaculture foods. So some of the technologies are that we're exploring are, are looking at how do you enhance the availability and accessibility, not just to the producer, but to consumers that are market-based. Uh, of foods with key nutrients um, that are essentially in nutrient-rich, therefore perishable foods. Um, so that's slightly different from storing grains or storing bulk uh, commodities post-harvest. It's enhancing uh, the nutrition of the diet of producer and non-producer uh, in, in uh, low-income settings. Um, the kind of work the Innovation Lab is doing at, at that kind of scale uh, includes um, pretty important assessment of uh, market access uh, to what extent um, being close or distant from markets is a major driver of agricultural decisions and decisions to buy or sell different kinds of commodities you know one might believe that that's that's stuff has been known for a very long time through the ag econ communities and it has but our panel research for example in, in Nepal that I mentioned is showing just how important it is uh, to understand that when one promotes for example production diversification assuming that that will lead to diet diversification one of the key uh, outcomes of concern for the uh, food security strategy well Promoting diversification seems to work when households are distant from functioning markets and not accessible with good roads uh, because they are relying relatively more on uh, own production, not entirely, but relatively more. The closer you get to markets where there is high demand for um, commodities you can sell at a reasonable price, then actually specialization kicks in and you get less production diversity but more diet diversity that is coming off the market. So the kinds of we're looking not just at technologies uh, but at the right of the right investments you know roads and bridges may well be in really important nutrition sensitive investments to enhance diets. Um, but and we're also then looking at policies and strategies uh, so that we can tailor the messages uh, to appropriately. So it's not just everyone should diversify their production base. That is important in some areas, but not others. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'll skip down to a question that came in during Dina's presentation for the Post Harvest Loss Lab. Joan Jennings asked or, or stated, that we have found some projects to use low-tech techniques recommended by national ministries of agriculture to measure moisture, such as using salt or sugar in a storage receptacle. Does the post-harvest lab have any experience information on results with these? And uh, Dick Tinsley chimed in to ask, can't an experienced person tell moisture mostly by feel? Not perfect, but accurate enough. Would you mind uh, chiming in on those questions? Sure, or at least I will do my best. Thanks, John, for that question. Um, it's actually an interesting one, and it was one that actually was a topic of debate at our annual meeting this year. Um, and so um, I think one of the one of the challenges that we find um, as um, these innovation labs that are, are university-based um, organizations is that we have researchers doing the work who are very much researchers and so we've actually had um, we've actually had a, some of our, our researchers that um, 
don't think that the SALT method, for example, um, is a good method and they want something that is, that is more specific. Um, however, others that have more of a practitioner base um, you know, swear by that SALT method. And so um, our, our exact, we don't have any exact research on the SALT method in the work that we have done, um, but we know that some of that work is out there and I think that that's that most that push and pull between what, um, you know, the perfect uh, getting in the way of the, of the good and, and how do we um, have really good research but have it be accessible. And so, um, I, yeah, I think there's some push and pull there. Um, to the question about testing by feel, um, the, one of the main problems with just doing it by feel, and certainly we see a lot of farmers that do it by feel or do it by a bite test where they'll bite into the grain and see how dry it is. The problem is, is that to create an environment in which something like aflatoxin can thrive, that difference in moisture doesn't have to be that much. So for example, um, for maize, um, you know, it's recommended to dry down to around 12%, um, but often that grain gets stored at 14% or above. And a 14% stored grain can create those conditions um, for, uh, for those fungal toxins to thrive. And so while it might, it might seem like those are really close together, the implications of even that small difference in percentage can be very great. And so having more accurate moisture measurement um, other than just feel uh, can really ultimately have an impact on people's health and livelihoods. Thank you so much, Dina. All right, another question came in from Archie Jarman that I think is of relevance to all of the innovation labs, uh, but it came in during Peter's presentation, so perhaps, Peter, you can kick off the answers. Uh, he said, I am curious if you, if you as the innovation lab, um, use the web, such as the AgriLinks website, uh, to share all of this great knowledge that you are producing and or are developing a knowledge bank to fill in the gap when you cannot be on the ground. And I think um, we can expand that question a little bit for each lab to tell us about um, how you are cataloging and storing the knowledge that you're generating, um, and also how you are sharing it both with other innovation labs um, and with other USAID implementers on the ground. Yep. Let's see. I clicked. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thanks. Great, great question, and um, uh, probably shouldn't have gotten me started on this topic because this is a very, very important topic that I think is um, under uh, studied or under um, uh, kind of approached. Uh, so you, Syl, the short answer is Syl is a highly engaged in uh, web-based um, uh, tech transfer and webinars. Um, uh, all our meetings um, are uh, we use we don't we use um, uh, a go to meeting platform whether it's go to meeting or go to webinar I you know we're just constantly using it. it's essential it's absolutely essential and the question is is bang on um, uh, we're very sensitive to moving people around uh, you know especially moving people back here but moving people around is we we feel is not a a good use of uh, of uh, uh, USA dollars and development dollars. But that opens up a much bigger question about the connectivity of our partners, and that's where we're spending a lot of time now. And I think that a lot of development value could be released if investment were placed on improving the connectivity um, of, um, of the, our partner institutions and um, organizations uh, where we're supporting, whether it be the private sector or whomever. There's a lot of capacity um, on the continent in terms of connectivity, and we found that last mile connectivity is what falters. I think we would be able to use uh, development dollars much more wisely to have much greater impact if we really focused on this one infrastructure investment connectivity uh, for our partners. But uh, there's a lot more on that subject. 
but uh, I'll leave it there. And I, I really thank the uh, the questioner for asking it because it really uh, is is very very important for effective development and, and stewarding scarce resources. Thank you, Peter. Patrick, would you like to chime in next? Could you? I I was having trouble hearing the the question. Can you just quick summarize quickly? Sure, no problem. Uh, it was mostly a question about uh, knowledge sharing. Um, how each of the labs is cataloging cataloging its knowledge, whether that be through the web or through another means, um, and how you are kind of actively in, engaging with other partners uh, to share all of this all of these great research results. Got it. Um, and obviously, I agree, with Peter. But hugely important. Um, several, obviously, several ways. The Nutrition Innovation Lab dot org website. All publications are there. Presentations are there. Um, every event. So that that's open uh, for for everyone. And of course, all the data collected uh, will be open access. Uh, so these large surveys that I'm talking about uh, offer a wealth of household level and farm level information that we're actively promoting, uh, particularly developing country partners to access and use uh, for their own purposes. And we'll certainly engage with them um, in that. I literally just came back last night um, from, a, uh, from Nepal where we have an annual, this was the fifth annual uh, scientific symposium we've organized, uh, f I have to say, uh, funded by the USAID mission, which sees the importance of building capacity and sharing information. Um, we had over 400 uh, registrants for the uh, this five-day uh, symposium this year. And we use that as, the, as a kind of real-time outreach to all our collaborators, um, scientific and research and programming, but especially in Nepal, but especially um, policymakers. So we actively in, uh, bring in um, uh, civil servants and policymakers from all sectors: agriculture, health, um, livestock, wash. Uh, so that there is an actual dialogue around implications of research as it is coming out, right? A real-time engagement. This year we opened it up so it was global. There was actual there were many participants from Africa and as well as South Asia. Um, so yes, web-based and uh, engagement is is really important. But so are those kind of fora where you bring researchers to engage and interact directly with policymakers. Um, and you can have vastly more impact through that kind of engagement than simply publishing papers. Uh, so it's, it's really important to, to find the appropriate ways. The other, finally, is that the in Nutrition Lab has been very active in developing curricula with in universities in the countries we, in which we work. Uh, as well as programs of both um, education and research. So we've set up a master's um, in nutrition and public health in Nepal. We've set up the country's first dietetics program in Malawi, for example, just two examples. Uh, and the, this is another way of building in new data, new findings relevant to those countries into training programs um, within tertiary in institutions uh, in those countries, um, but especially building in the skill sets, you know, not just research findings, but what it took to do those re this research, and um, working with local faculty to build up capacity, essentially a training of trainers, but an academic and scientific training of trainers, so that we're we're leaving behind capacity in countries to undertake and understand this kind of work, not just uh, share findings. Thank you, Patrick. And Dina, would you like to uh, discuss this a bit as well? Sure. Or I'll just say, in the interest of time, I think I'll just say that I, I very much agree with, with the points and the priorities that both Peter and Patrick have laid out, and really just say that it's an area we're continuing to work toward as a program. Um, I, I think that we've got a lot of room for growth, but certainly I think that, that all of those avenues 
to disseminate information are important, um, and we're continuing to try to to try to get our findings out um, more across kind of um, across all those platforms. So um, it, it was a well placed question, and thank you for it. Great, thank you, Dina, and I agree. Um, all right, we're all just about at time, but I wanted to squeeze in uh, one final question for Patrick uh, that came in almost right at the beginning of the presentation uh, from Gary Alex, who stated that the finding that sheep and goats in the house is related to environmental enteropathy is very interesting. Have there been any analyses of the social factors that might affect this, such as caste or the number of small ruminants owned? And as a side question, just how do we take into account such unintended consequences from the promotion of nutritious food? Mm. Can you give a brief answer or address ah, Briefly, that the unintended consequences. That, <laughs> that is something we all need to uh, bear in mind much more. We need to promote the, the production and management of, of foods, and including animal source foods, that are crucial to improved diets and nutrition. But we do have to pay special attention to unintended consequences, which is all about uh, appropriate management, quality of, of seeds or animals, effective um, health care of crops or animals, and, and so on. Um, yes, we, we are uh, going to be digging deeper into the, uh, the characteristics of households that, that, al that allow um, ruminants to wander in and out. Obviously, chickens are another dimension of that, but that's pretty much universal. Um, uh, versus those that don't. Um, this is, of course, critical for both WASH and this, the whole area of gut microbiome, shared pathogens between livestock and uh, humans. Uh, this is a, a cutting edge area that needs much more re research. Um, it's not easy because you have to re you have to do um, careful analysis, uh, which means collection of either human and animal feces or urine, uh, and potential you know therefore lab analyses and DNA analysis. So this is an area that for the future, where we need to understand more about not what goes into the mouth, but what comes out, what is digested or not, and to what extent the environment in which children grow up um, influences that. Um, this is really important um, and something for the future. Thank you, Patrick. Well, there certainly is a lot of research ahead to be done. And I know that the, uh, the innovation labs, both the three that were showcased today and all of the uh, Feed the Future Innovation Labs will be delving into lots of this interesting research going forward. So I would like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and attempt today on an AgriLinks webinar. And uh, we're, we're very grateful for the information that you shared. I'd also like to thank the uh, Feed the Future KDAD project for producing this webinar. And most importantly, I would like to thank all of you, our attendees, uh, for making these webinars possible through signing on through asking your questions and for continuing to return to AgriLinks. Uh, so we'll go ahead and wrap up the webinar today. We will be taking a break in August, so no AgriLinks webinar in August, but we'll be back in September. But there will be some exciting changes on the agrilinks.org website coming soon, so please do continue to uh, keep an eye open for our newsletters in your inbox and uh, signing on to the website to engage. Thank you very much, and we will see you soon.